Hello and welcome to today's workshop, Arts in Boston with Gallery 360. This workshop is brought to you by Pathfinder. Pathfinder is an extracurricular program for incoming first and second year students at Northeastern. And we provide a safe and inclusive space for students to discuss and pursue their passions. On our website, you can find links to the Pathfinder applications for first and second years, also applications for moderators, which is open to third, fourth, and fifth year students, as well as recent alumni, and also more resources and information about our program. If you're looking for more of our past workshops, you can check out our YouTube channel or our podcast to see all the workshops we had from spring semester. And now I'll pass it over to Gallery360. Thanks so much, Tandiwe. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Amy Halliday. I'm director of the Center for the Arts in Northeastern uh, and curator of Gallery360. Uh, just to mention that there are children playing outside and a dog next to me. So if there are any interruptions, it's just life being lived. I'm sure you uh, know what that's like. So uh, a little bit of an introduction. Really, what I'm going to do today um, is tell is kind of um, focus in on our contemporary art space at Northeastern, which is called Gallery 360, which I don't know about you, but I haven't decided where the name came from. Is it named after 360 Huntington? Is it like a 360 degree thing? I have so many questions, but um, it certainly offers um, a lot of possibilities. And then we're going to broaden out uh, to um, arts on campus more broadly, and then kind of move our way out geographically to things that you can access um, easily from Northeastern. Um, and then some other favorites will um, jump in with um, the gallery, current gallery co-op, Alex, uh, to give some suggestions from a student's perspective of fun things uh, in the arts in Boston. So we're gonna kind of start from the center, um, which is Northeastern, uh, and move our way out. So yeah, um, let me go from there. So Gallery 360 uh, is a contemporary art lab. We like to think of it as a, as a lab because it's very experimental. Uh, it's a space for learning, discovery, for maybe a bit of risk taking, which we hope you as an audience will participate in um, because it's really a place where we want you to think differently, engage with new ideas, engage with new people, uh, encounter difference, uh, perhaps difference of opinion, difference of perspective, um, and have a space where, where it's safe to do that. So the gallery um, is located in the Curry Student Center or where Curry Student Center and L Hall intersect. They actually have this long corridor connecting them which has been partially reclaimed for this pretty cool gallery space with a big um, glass wall, as you can see here. Um, and as you can see, this is an exhibition actually from a couple of falls ago, which was looking at um, artists engaging with um, major scientific kind of issues and, and, and uh, global crises uh, through the arts. So you never know when you might see something like bonsai trees wearing little knitted sweaters uh, or an interactive work that you can engage with yourself or an audio piece or something like that. So you're always gonna encounter something different. We have about three or four large contemporary art exhibitions with um, major local, national, international artists. Um, and then every year we also have, um, and all of those will have integrated programming and things like that. But every year we also have the CAMD, uh, College of Arts, Media and Design senior graduating show. So you'll see that in the kind of April, May time each year. So this is Gallery 360. It's a contemporary art lab for innovative ideas and exhibitions. But it's also an academic resource. So like a classroom, it is a space for teaching, learning, and research. Um, so you might find yourself in a class that comes to the gallery to engage with the content. You can see students here um, on the top where we were actually having a discussion based on Helena Metaferia's Against the Sharp White Background, which was an exhibition that explored institutional racism, particularly in the art world. And that was uh, January of, um, of last year. And so classes from all different uh, curricula and disciplines across campus came to engage with these issues through the artwork. So using art is really the, the catalyst for these discussions. So you might come to the gallery um, in a class visit, but you may also come anytime you want to on your own. It's free, it's open uh, almost every day, except Sundays. Um, and there's lots of ways that you can engage with the teaching and learning and programming there. It also becomes a site for a lot of um, interdisciplinary research projects. So we'll have faculty working together around related issues. Um, we might 
be creating exhibitions and programs that are collaborations with other offices on campus. Like here, you can actually see us um, in Snell Library at the archives. There are really incredible um, archives of social activism uh, in the Boston area, particularly Roxbury, um, that live in Northeastern's archives. Um, and that informed the artist who um, created this exhibition, Helena Metaferia. You can actually see her there in the black and white. Um, and students were working with her towards her next show, which is actually going to be at the MFA in the fall. So we're really excited about that. Seeing how students work is actually informing an exhibition that's um, coming onto view um, at the MFA soon, so just around the corner. It's also a hub for campus and community programming. So we will have a lot of different programs linked to any exhibition from a fun opening reception with the artist speaking about their work to things like artist talks, workshops, networking events, um, really a full range of things, symposia, conferences, um, really the whole range of possibilities for what programs could look like. And of course, a lot of those have been virtual. So an example you can see here is at the bottom, we partnered with uh, the regional New England Contemporary Art Fair area code, which was a COVID responsive um, uh, art fair that was held during the summer. And a lot of that programming, which I helped to curate as public programs curator in collaboration with them, was, was virtual. And so we had, for example, virtual panel discussions on topics such as uh, art in the expanding digital space. Um, or the state of contemporary art in New England. So you'll see that we have a variety of in-person as well as digital programs that you can jump in on. Now, another thing I wanted to mention is that Gallery 360 is also a great place to either um, apply for a co-op or be a student worker. So um, we tend to have one student worker at any time um, being in that space, monitoring the space, looking after things like the physical integrity of the works, you know, checking that things aren't falling down or uh, don't need attention, but also really being a frontline ambassador, someone who engages visitors as they come in, uh, talks about the artwork, um, helps people feel welcome, and really makes the connection between art and people. So we, our student workers are really an important part of the team. Um, and then, of course, there's a co-op position. So every We'll have these six month positions where you really get to um, see behind the scenes of every element of what it's like to run and work in a contemporary gallery space. And this is everything from, you know, extensive email exchanges with artists to um, hanging a show, which is just you do it till it's done. It's uh, unpredictable hours, uh, unpredictable problems and creative problem solving that come your way, like trying to lift 100 pounds of textile uh, at an asymmetric angle and then suspend it from the ceiling. But you never know what this work is going to look like. So it's really, um, it's really quite a fun one. And our co-op, Alex, who will introduce himself later, uh, can uh, tell you a little bit more about that if you're interested. So what I thought I'd do is give you a little look inside Gallery 360 from the perspective of our 360 degree cameras, which we've actually been using during COVID to make virtual tours so that they would be accessible to people who couldn't visit during the pandemic, um, but also something we could use for hyper teaching. Now, of course, those kinds of tools and resources have turned out to be things that we want to keep anyway, because they make our work more accessible. Um, and they also, um, they, they also provide a really wonderful document and record of the exhibitions that we've done. So those kind of live on even when, um, when the shows come down. Just want to check on the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna get out of this, whoopsie, and then share with you. So here's an example of an exhibition page. Um, so our most recent exhibition was Dream Boston. So you can find us, I'll send you the link, I'll put the link in later for um, where you can find information about our exhibitions. But each of them has this little 3D tour, which you can open up to full size and we'll take you through the exhibition. So here's our most recent exhibition, Dream Boston. Uh, and the idea here actually came from our neighbors on Huntington Avenue, uh, the Huntington Theater Company. And during the pandemic, early on, I think maybe April 2020, they invited local playwrights to imagine a post-pandemic future for Boston. And they imagined a place they longed to gather at with the people they longed to gather with in a time when that just wasn't possible. And, you know, continues to be difficult for theater. 
and they created short audio plays. So these were released as podcasts and the series was called Dream Boston. Each of these set in a very specific Boston lo locale. I do recommend that you uh, have a listen to those because it's a great way of getting to know the city through the kind of layers and experiences and memories and perceptions and imaginations of some of the, the greatest local playwrights. So that was really inspiring to me. Um, and as the summer progressed, a lot of the audio plays uh, began to focus on racial justice, um, on social injustice, and, um, and that kind of wove their way into this imaging of the future of Boston. And so um, I decided to try to respond and to expand this call to Dream Boston into the gallery. Um, and so I partnered with one of the uh, playwrights, Miranda Dekoje, who wrote one of the pieces that is in the uh, Huntington Theatre audio play series. And the two of us co-curated an exhibition that invited visual artists, like those theatre artists, to dream the city. Um, and this was the exhibition uh, that resulted from that. So as you come into the gallery, so if we pull out a little bit, you'll see that glass wall again, that corridor. As you come into the gallery, the first work you see is this wonderful piece by Sage Evangelina, who's primarily a muralist and actually um, did uh, industrial design at Wentworth, which is just around the corner on Parker Street from Northeastern. So she has this really incredible abstract line work um, that almost reads like territorial mapping. And this piece looking both back and forward really seemed to capture a lot of our thinking about what it means to, to dream to dream a city that's kind of constantly in flux, being made and unmade and remade by those who live within it. So we go through, and then we see this other work by Seiji, where she actually took a canvas that she had already, um, and she expanded it out into the walls. So really working between this kind of typical painting and mural work to create this work that really took up space in the gallery. It was really fun to see this, this uh, kind of take form over our week of installation. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I encourage you to all take a virtual tour yourself. These little um, circles or hot spots give you the label text and things like that. So you can uh, take a closer look at that. Um, this work, whoopsie, it's very difficult to navigate this thing. Let me go back. And every time you see this funny little uh, circle where you can't see that much detail, it's actually from the 360 degree camera and it's, um, its own footprint of the, um, what is it called? The tripod that it was standing on. So this work was also super popular. This is uh, Umin Kim's piece, um, Urban Nest Boston, um, which is a massive textile, think like eight feet. And it's hanging from the ceiling and it is made of found and discarded fabrics and objects from all around Boston. So this is literally made of the stuff of Boston and every fragment or is it a kind of a relic of someone's lived experience. Um, it is, it tells a little story, it holds a little dream um, and together it creates this kind of urban fabric of the city. And I think what's wonderful about it is the way in which each of us recognizes something and has a story associated with it. So it, it becomes something that can hold uh, our own experiences too. So this work was really, was really quite fabulous, um, but also quite challenging for us to hang. Um, and then you make your way through. We actually have a video space here, but because of copyright, um, there isn't actually, you can't see it on, the, uh, on, on this page. Uh, so you have to be there to be um, watching the videos by Eugene Moon. And as you see, we move into the next part of our space. And <clears throat> here we had um, a wonderful abstract work by the artist Ma, who um, mostly works uh, in street art, um, but is doing these really um, fascinating abstract works where each layer of paint, which is kind of scraped uh, and laid on, is covered and sealed in resin. So it all kinds of creates this kind of like set of suspended layers. Um, which all reflect and refract differently and kind of they start to take on their surroundings and you get included in the image as you look at it um, and it's full of his own kind of mythology and um, uh, and kind of signs and iconography so things that are important to him as he builds up this, his own visual language you can almost a lot of people it was really fun to chat to them because people you know read into it too people were like oh I, I see this as a parking meter or something like that but each of these each person really had an experience of this work as something to do with the kind of 
glimpses of urban life, maybe things seen when you're rushing past on the highway or the kind of lights in the darkness, um, bits of building, that kind of thing. So a really kind of complex but expansive um, vision. And then just for a sense of sheer variety, we've got this abstract painting next to um, a photographic series. So something, you know, there's always a variety of media for folks to engage with. So, you know, if you think, oh, I only understand this kind of art or that's not for me, I, I encourage you to spend some time in the gallery because there's really something for everyone. Um, this is the work of um, Candace Jackson who um, has been photographing children in her Dorchester community. And if you know anything about portraiture, or at least particularly kids' portraits, like school portraits, they're always you know, fully frontal, big smile, equal lighting. Um, and there's something wonderful about these kind of oblique images where it feels like each child has like a special secret or like a whole world, an interior world that you're not, you don't have access to. And they're illuminated in these like beautiful ways. Um, so, so really just gorgeous portraits. And then, oh, let me step back a little bit. We had this really complicated to hang sign project. Ugh, I've gone too far. Let's see if I can maneuver myself. There we go. Um, grab some water. Where the artist Jane Marshing, who um, has, been, has been doing this ongoing project called the Utopia Project, where she hand prints uh, these signs. So she's cut out uh, wooden letters and she uses foraged materials to make ink. So these inks are made from, again, the stuff of Boston. They are made from walnuts, uh, walnut trees. Um, and then she's using that ink on her hand cut letters uh, on Tyvek, which is insulation material, to make these banners that, that kind of read maybe as like protest banners. Um, but um, they, they tend to hold the words of utopian thinkers. So this idea of thinking of the future as a way of helping us manifest it, because we need artists, we need thinkers to imagine the world we want to see in order that the rest of us can move towards manifesting it. Um, and so this is actually a quotation from her book, Speaking of the Future, which contains the thoughts of uh, great, great utopian thinkers from maybe the last you know, I want to say 400 years. Um, so we're thinking, you know, everything from uh, Sir Thomas More, who came up with the term utopia, to um, Adrian Marie Brown. So real, you know, uh, uh, historical range. So here the, the signs say, I am, we are, that is enough. Now we have to start. It's the opening words um, of, a, of a book called The Spirit of Utopia, written just after the First World War. And then the final work in Dream Boston was this pair of works. Again, there's a video piece um, that is a little bit harder to engage with with the, the, the virtual tour. But this is a work by Furen Dai, uh, who has for many years been trying to understand uh, how the kind of concept of race gains salience in the US and changes over time based on US census data or the way in which the US uh, census structures the data it asks for uh, and the categories it, it presents as options um, solidifies uh, social relations in various ways. And so she has a series of, um, of these vinyl prints looking at language and slippage of categories. She looks um, at um, things like country of birth, at language spoken, uh, at race and ethnicity, and the way in which these these kind of categories or, or bureaucratic blocks uh, then come to kind of stifle um, or, or categorize and kind of um, exclude and include um, according to these labels. And so what she then does is create um, a video work called On the Future Ruin, which thinks about how all those categories, uh, all those forms of difference and the ways in which they gain salience in society um, and are kind of mobilized in different ways with different power structures, how they might play out in the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. So we might think of museums actually as a kind of a microcosm of these social issues. Um, and so she um, takes us on a tour of the Museum of Fine Arts as if it's 100 years into the future and all we have is the ruin. And we are futuristic archeologists trying to understand the society of today 
um, through through um, this tour that we get from what we can see left behind. We try to understand the values and the issues of society today. So really wonderful video. So that just gives you a, a, a sense of the kind of range of things that you might see in Gallery 360 based on our most recent exhibition and just the size of the space uh, as well. It's a good kind of thousand square feet. So modest, but you can do a lot of interesting things with it. So going back to this presentation, you've seen a little bit of the gallery now um, from the 360 degree tours. Now you can actually go back to our past three exhibitions um, and tour them that way. <coughs> um, so I encourage you if you're interested in finding out more about the gallery uh, to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Another job of the co-op is very much um, thinking through social media campaigns. Um, so you'll see some great work there. Now moving outside of gallery 360 uh, to a little bit beyond that into what is happening on campus. So actually you can see that my virtual background is this work by um, Silvia Lopez Chavez, um, who is a Boston based artist um, who did this incredible set of murals um, at Ruggel Station, which is right in the center um, of our campus. Um, but it's really, it, it's, it's um, both an iconic kind of landmark and it brings so much joy through its, kind of, through its color and its rhythms. But it's actually only one of about 20 incredible murals that we have on campus. So there's a very active um, uh, program of public art, um, which is overseen by a public art manager. And I will encourage you to look at this website, I will, um, which is down here, because they've just launched a fabulous new website about all the murals, where to find them, what they're about, interviews with artists, great videos. So you will come across things from like a raging dinosaur to... Um, you know, a small, a small image of Edgar Allan Poe. I'm trying to think of all um, optical illusions in architectural form. Um, and there are new ones popping up all the time. So public art is a big deal. Sometimes it's mural form. Sometimes it's kind of architectural and sculptural. Um, but there's a lot of thinking about how we can actually um, change and uh, change our perceptions and our experience of public space through public art. Then I'm going to introduce Alex to speak a little bit more about how you can get involved as a student. Hi, so I'm Alex. I'm the uh, Gallery 360 co-op, but I'm also a part of SPARK, which is Northeastern student-run contemporary art collective. Um, I just finished up as head curator and now will be the incoming co-executive director. Um, so I'm always happy to plug all the cool things that we're doing. Um, our main thing that we do each year, or each semester rather, is we put on an exhibition. So our most recent one was called Spark Self-Titled. Um, and you can see it here. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it is a, a virtual exhibition, but it's in a, in a 3D space. Um, so you should go check that out. Um, the general idea behind that was um, taking the idea of a self-titled album and then kind of flipping that to a visual medium um, as a way for both Spark and artists um, to like kind of make a formal introduction of themselves. Uh, to the Boston art scene. And then also um, the kind of prompt for our artists had to do with um, how they define a spark um, and using this kind of as a, a project of co-defining and co-creating um, some metaphorical significance of a spark. Go to the next slide, please. But we do a lot more than just exhibitions. Um, I have a long list here on the right. Um, as you can see in the top photo, we do paint nights. Um, this was our, our spring break themed paint night. Uh, bucket hats were a real hit that day. Um, we also have a podcast called What the Spark that's in collaboration with uh, WRBV Radio. We did an I Voted sticker contest um, in collaboration with Northeastern. We also do team bonding events, museum and gallery tours, uh, art exchanges, pop-up exhibitions. Uh, artist talks, uh, and we're designing a zine catalog and more. So if you're interested in getting involved or learning more, either follow uh, SparkNEU on, Insta on Instagram, or you can uh, message me. I'm always happy to talk your ear off about Spark. Uh, my email is eubanks.al at northeastern.edu. Next slide. I think that's all for Spark. Cool. There we go. Try that again. Uh, so as you can see, um, our you know gallery co-ops really are both connected to other arts activities on campus, and where you're able to kind of bring your experiences and your other interests to the work of the gallery. Um, and we've certainly 
grown and changed and developed with each co-op and the things that they bring, the things that they want to explore. Um, so we're excited about this collaboration or closer connection with Spark. And of course, there's other student um, art and design oriented organizations like Scout uh, that I know you've, um, you, you'll you see other resources related to. So there are a lot of ways to get involved. The Mural Club, in fact, our incoming co-op is very involved in the Mural Club. So we keep these connections um, and they just grow, which is really a, a beautiful part of Northeastern is this kind of um, interest in collaborating and partnering um, across campus. But that's not all. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the institutional memberships that Northeastern has access to. Now, some of these might be subject to change, but these two have been pretty, pretty um, stable across time. Um, and these are really helpful for you to know um, because they can save you a lot of money. Um, so the first museum membership that we have uh, is to the Museum of Fine Arts, which is just around the corner on Huntington. Well, it depends where you are, I guess, on Northeastern's campus, but it's, um, you know, it's right there. And what I learned recently is that it is the 14th largest museum in the world. I did not know this. I mean, it's big, but I didn't realize it was way up there. And this is in terms of kind of public gallery space um, and second only to the Met in the US. So this is right on the edge of our campus. That's a pretty amazing thing to have access to. Um, it has almost half a million um, works of art uh, and material culture. And it's what is called an encyclopedic museum. Um, this idea that it has a little bit of everything, which you can imagine is also a little bit of a problematic kind of uh, concept. Um, and it's something that Feren Dai in her video piece that we just talked about in Dream Boston actually kind of critiques um, this idea of it having, you know, like something of everything from every culture. But it is a really incredible place um, to visit. And there are a lot of things that you'll um, be able to learn and see um, through this space. So you can uh, take your take your student card and get free entry. At the moment, you need to book that in advance with a special code, um, which, we, which can be provided for you. Um, they also have a lot of kind of late night events. Um, I think Thursday they have um, late opening hours and there's always interesting stuff going on. So I do encourage you to check it out. It's um, a museum that's been around since 1870, originally in Cop Copley Square and then it moved to uh, Fenway back when like, it really wasn't a big thing. There wasn't a lot developed around the marshes. It was just seen as this kind of like marshy land out there in the hinterlands of Boston. Um, and so I think it moved in maybe like 1909, um, but it is really kind of a, an anchor um, of the area now alongside Northeastern and many of the other institutions that are in the Fenway area too. So do check that out. It's pretty awesome and I'm sure, um, and they have temporary exhibitions um, all the time, um, blockbuster exhibitions, contemporary shows. And as I mentioned, Helena Metaferia, the artist who first showed, did her first solo debut in Boston at Northeastern will have a show there in the fall. So I encourage you all to see that. The other museum that we have an institutional membership to is the ICA. So that's a little further afield uh, in the South, uh, in the Seaport region. Um, Although the ICA actually was originally elsewhere as well, that's often the case of Boston institutions, they, they sometimes move around. Um, so the ICA, uh, you know, it's the Institute of Contemporary Art, but of course, um, contemporary is always the art of the now. Um, when it started, it was actually called, I think it was the Boston Museum of Modern Art, and was seen as this kind of like renegade, um, you know, relative of MoMA in New York. Um, but over time, it wanted to kind of separate out and really dedicate itself, uh, move away from this term modern and dedicate itself to the art of our time. Um, and it is just an incredible place with its own small permanent collection, but also constantly changing temporary exhibitions, a really awesome um, set of um, uh, monthly um, activities, things like, I mean, the last one I went to there was like a tango class and there were live art making things. Um, and there's always, the, there's always something going on. There's usually like local DJs. Um, so the ICA really has a lot to offer. And you can also, again, get in there with your student card. Um, so that's, oh, and then the other thing that's very cool about the ICA is that every two years they have something called the Foster Prize, which is a kind of biennial where they um, choose two to three Boston artists or Boston area artists and they really focus in on them and they say these are the most important people kind of emerging talents um, to be looking at right now in Boston 
um, and they give them like pretty, pretty substantial exhibitions. And that's really important that we kind of celebrate and look at the artists right here. So often folks are like, oh, it must be New York or it must be LA, but there is so much incredible work happening right in Boston. And so it's, it's always exciting to see the, the Foster Prize and see who, um, who the ICA curators and others are, are, are watching and presenting to us. So that's the ICA. So those are the two that we have institutional memberships to, um, but there's a bunch of other local spots that I'm going to recommend and then Alex is going to recommend, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to leave so many out, partly because there's always so much new stuff going on. So one that I wanted to mention is the Boston Center for the Arts. So this is in the South End, uh, still, you know, walkable or an easy bus from campus. Um, it's a nonprofit visual and performing arts complex. Um, it has everything from like theaters and live music spaces to um, artist studio spaces, like affordable workspaces uh, and, and visual arts exhibition spaces. And one of the super cool things about the Boston Center for the Arts is that it includes this historic building called the Cyclorama, which was this huge rotunda building, which was created to actually show um, uh, hundreds I don't actually know what the dimensions are, like hundreds of feet, a huge panoramic um, painting of the Battle of Gettysburg. And the idea was, and this is like 19th century, this was the closest you could get to kind of cinema almost, uh, or kind of immersive experience before the digital, um, was the circular painting that you were surrounded on um, in all, at, at all sides. Anyway, so it's no longer used for panoramic paintings, um, and kind of immersive spectacles um, of the 19th century. But what it is used for is both uh, kind of events, um, book fairs, things like that. And then sometimes incredible installations like this example here of the artist Nick Cave who um, made this kind of joyful space full of bright inflatable creatures that kind of took over the cyclorama that was part of a multi-part um, project that involved like a parade, uh, a new mural, all kinds of things. So the cyclorama, just a really fun and, and interesting part of Boston history that, like I was saying about Boston, just gets like made and remade and reshaped um, as people interact with it differently. So Boston Center for the Arts, one to check out. Right nearby us as well um, is the Isabella Stewart Gardner. So we don't have a membership there, but you can, of course, get reduced entry as a, as a student. Um, and as you can see from this image, this is a pretty unique space. Um, and that's because Boston art collector and philanthropist, 19th century um, um, woman, um, Isabella Stewart Gardner, um, wanted to house her incredible collection of American, Asian and European art and antiquities um, in a place that looked like a 15th century Venetian palazzo. So it's not like sometimes what happens in the US is, is uh, folks build uh, kind of uh, transfer buildings from other countries like brick by brick, but this was actually built all in Boston from like new materials and everything. But every detail was carefully chosen and designed to give you the real feel of a Venetian palazzo. And then it's filled of course with decorative arts and a whole textile room, that's my favorite, um, incredible paintings. I mean, Isabella Stewart Gardner was the first person to own, uh, the first person in the US to own a Botticelli. Um, so just an incredible collection. And it's so amazing to see it in the space and to spend time in this interior courtyard, which is always full of flowers. So when you're in the depths of winter, this is the place you need to come. You need to come, I think it's February or March for nasturtium season, where every one of those um, windows is hung with these like orange, you know, orange trellised uh, nasturtiums, for example. And they have a lot of great live music here of all genres. Um, and there's just something pretty magical um, about the space. And if you didn't know, it is also the scene of the probably the world, or at least the USA's most famous um, unsolved art crime. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a, uh, a robbery in which a number of significant artworks were, were stolen, including um, the only Rembrandt seascape and a Vermeer. If you know anything about Vermeer, there's only like 35 in the world. So even getting one stolen is kind of a big deal. Um, and these works were never recovered. So it's like the greatest unsolved mystery and it all took a place around the corner. So lots to see at the Isabella Stewart Gardner. 
Um, you'll notice that there is a lot going on along the orange line. Um, I find that a really interesting and useful kind of line of connection between where I live um, and some of the things that I like to do um, around Boston. So for me, it's all about the orange line. Um, and one of the things that happens is very uniquely the only gallery, art gallery in a train station, which is the Boston Cyber Arts Gallery, which is actually in Green Street Station. Um, and it is also the only gallery in Boston, I think, that um, focuses entirely on new media and experimental art and technology. Um, so super cool space, um, does really interesting things, has different exhibitions every month. It's been closed during COVID, but what they've done instead is to really activate the windows. So there's always something new um, up during that time. They also connect up to festivals, uh, to um, site-specific installations, digital installations around Boston. So they're always doing interesting things. Um, and when I first arrived in Northeastern, I went to an exhibition there because some of our own professors were showing um, at an exhibition um, at the Boston Cyber Arts Gallery. So if you go to Green Street Station, make sure you take a, take a look at what's going on. Um, a little um, close enough to campus, you could probably also walk, but also great public transport. I mean, great, great for a US city. Uh, it's, not, it's not New York, but it's pre pretty darn good in Boston with all the institutions and all the kind of vibrancy of things going on. There's some pretty decent public transport. Um, but you could get to what are called the SOA galleries. This was a kind of um, concerted city effort to brand this area as a kind of art and design district. So SOA is really just a, an abbreviation, which means south of Washington. Um, and you'll find there are about 20 commercial galleries with really incredible uh, original art. Um, a little bit, you know, different tastes, different kind of register and tones for, for different galleries. So you'll find the ones that really suit your interests. Um, there are also, um, there's an artist guild um, with a bunch of studio spaces that often you can actually visit. So there's a lot going on down here. Sometimes there are vintage fairs, lots of other things that happen kind of right there um, in that SOA district, especially when COVID is not um, constraining us, but I do encourage you to um, spend some time there. They have um, first Friday openings where new exhibitions open in almost all of these galleries. So there's a really wonderful vibe um, if you want to head down there. Um, and then also around the corner from us or um, is the um, Tufts School of the Museum of Fine Arts. And so Tufts University actually formed a partnership with the Museum of Fine Arts, which I talked about recently. Um, and they have the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, which offers one of the most important MFA programs in the country. And it's a place where a lot of great artists um, have their start. And I wanted to mention it because it's walkable. There's a small gallery with really interesting work. Um, and you can see more work on the Tufts Medford campus. But I wanted to bring this up because most universities have galleries and museums. And that might not be something you think of when you think of the art scene, but actually so many institutions, and there are hundreds in Boston, they'll have galleries, they'll have museums, and many of them are free. So Harvard, not free, um, but many of the others are free and they all have reduced entry anyway for students. And each of them, programs, openings, all kinds of cool things. So lots to keep an eye on. I'm going to hand over now uh, to Alex to tell you a little bit about some of his um, favorites um, from what he's been exploring in the Boston art scene. Yeah, so first I want to echo everything Amy just said because she stole like half my recommendations. <laughs> They're all really great places that I would definitely recommend checking out. Um, yeah, like I know Boston Cyber Arts was on my list earlier. Also, I'm going to talk a little bit more about SOA, but I'll, I'll run through my list from the top. Um, one of my favorite places is Piano Craft Gallery that's located on Tremont Street. So it's very close to campus. Um, that's what the top picture is. That was from uh, this weekend. Uh, basically, that was their uh, uh, collaboration with BU showing off their MFA and painting program. Uh, Dorchester Art Project is another recommendation. I, you would be shocked like just how many local artists get their start there. I can't tell you how many artists I've done research on and realized like scrolling back through their CV that Dorchester Art Project was where they started. Um, they're doing all kinds of cool things. Their gallery is unfortunately currently closed, but they have a lot of other stuff going on. Um, they have a shop, they have studios for artists to work in. They like sell music, they sell like merch, they, they do a little bit of everything. Um, and then uh, for SOA gallery recommendations, there are two here that I recommend. 
both of which I'm probably going to butcher their pronunciations, but the uh, Abigail Ogilvy Gallery and the Ogilvy, yeah. Okay, and the Liza and Gianni uh, Gallery. Um, both of those were ones that um, I've had a chance to check out recently um, and got talking to a couple of people who worked there. Uh, interesting stuff going on there, but also just recommend SOA in general. Um, the open studios are great, and a lot of the events that um, Amy was talking about are starting to reopen again, which is really exciting. It's like First Fridays are coming back, they're a little bit more lively, all that good stuff. Um, and then Boston also has a great public art scene. Um, I would highly recommend Undergrounded Ink Block, has a whole lot of uh, public art in one place. Um, I'm cheating a little bit and going outside of Boston for this one, but Central Square also has a lot. Um, I was there this weekend and saw a mural by Sage Evangelina, um, who is one of our artists from Green Boston. So it was nice to see that connection. Um, and then also, this one isn't so much as a place as it is an organization, but now in there is a public art accelerator um, that does a lot of interesting things. So they're a really interesting group to follow, see what they're up to and what kind of things they're working on. Uh, next slide, please. And then beyond just galleries and museums, there's a lot of other cool things going on as well. Um, as far as publications go, Boston Art Review is like your one-stop shop for everything arts in Boston. Uh, I highly recommend signing up for their newsletter and you will get like every possible art event going on. Um, I also have a picture from uh, their virtual um, reception for the launch of one of their um, publications uh, that if you look really closely, you can see Amy and I in. <laughs> um, and then Boston Compass is another good one. Um, they're kind of affiliated with Dorchester Art Project. They're following the, the same umbrella organization of brain arts. Um, and then other organizations, uh, this one I just learned about really recently, uh, House of Venus does um, right now mostly virtual exhibitions, but they also do pop-up exhibitions um, and uh, some other workshops. They're run by two recent college grads. Um, actually, both of these SOA galleries that I mentioned earlier, um, the people who work there also run this like in their side time. So kind of a cool little connection there. Um, and then also the Boston Art Book Fair. It's closed this year, but that was at uh, the Boston Center for the Arts um, in 2019, I guess. It was very fun. So when that comes back, definitely would recommend. And then on the next slide, I also just have some general notes, um, some sage wisdom for you all, which is um, I highly recommend just follow a lot of arts organizations on Instagram, on social media. Um, and that's kind of how you find out about like what new and exciting events and exhibitions are happening. Um, and then the next ones are a really big one for me is always talk to people who are in the gallery or with artists or whoever is there because they can answer your questions. They have great recommendations for like other places for you to go and check out. Um, and generally, like if you're interested in working in the arts, it's also great networking. But uh, yeah, like I've, I've gone to like so well, like uh, open studios before, and just like in each one, just like ask ask the person in there, where should I go next? And they'll tell you, like they'll give you a great recommendation. You'll go there, you'll tell them, oh my God, like so and so just told me I should come here. And then by the end of the night, you met like a whole bunch of people. Um, and then, yeah, also don't be afraid of like going to uh, exhibitions and events alone. Um, I feel like that's kind of how I learned the most about like what art I like and I don't like, because um, you're not really swayed as much by other people's opinions. Um, and then, yeah, the Boston art scene in general, I just say is very vibrant and very interconnected. And I think that's something you realize the more kind of events and exhibitions you start going to. And that is all for me, I believe. Absolutely. I think that is all from the both of us, and that's a lot. Um, but I wonder if, um, yeah, if there are any questions, we're happy to jump in and answer. Yeah, thank you so much for this like very detailed and helpful resource. Um, I was wondering, so you you source a lot of local Boston artists, but I'm just curious a little bit more what that process is like, um, like outreach and what you look for and how you get those relationships for Gallery 360. That's a great question. Um, so let me take a step back and say how I curate exhibitions in general. So, and, and also just talk a little bit about the work of a curator. Um, so instead of us kind of looking at um, proposals that other people send to us for an exhibition, we're generating them internally. We're creating original exhibitions uh, for Gallery 360. Um, and so that means you do have to be constantly looking at new things, going to places, meeting people, thinking through ideas, um, getting a sense of what people are talking about in the contemporary art world in Boston. So um, I go to a lot of stuff. So a big thing for me is turning up, uh, going to events, 
Um, so the exhibitions that I can see at all of these institutions that we've uh, mentioned might expose me to new artists or new ideas um, that might then kind of um, catalyze something in my thinking. When it comes to um, curating an exhibition, I like to try to start with an artwork that really moves me in some way that kind of, um, and so I, I would often experience a really powerful uh, transformative experience with an artwork that made me think differently or see differently or just challenge my perception uh, in, in an interesting way. Um, and then what I often find is that if, as I delve into that artwork, it opens up a whole line of inquiry that can develop into an exhibition. Um, so if you think about something like Umin Kim's work, that big fabric piece, that was a piece that really opened up thinking, thinking through this idea of dreaming Boston. Um, so um, yeah, so we tend to work on a kind of uh, year, six to 12 month schedule where we're planning in advance. Um, and um, I'll build relationships both by turning up at events and meeting people and then looking after those relationships over time because it isn't really a one-to-one. -one. You don't kind of meet someone somewhere and then be like, hey, you wanna exhibit next month? It's really, um, you build this kind of network of possibilities that are part of your kind of aesthetic and, and conceptual um, nexus. And then one day the strands come together in a really interesting way when you're thinking, ah, it would be really timely to think through questions of, uh, I don't know, algorithmic bias. And you've met this artist um, that did this project at MIT, or you've you know, connected with these people who can help you think through these ideas. Um, so yeah, uh, so it kind of comes from many years of building relationships and having great conversations. Um, and then you'll do something like, as Alex and I have been doing this semester, doing studio visits. So going to artist spaces and seeing their physical works and talking to them about them. And those conversations are what often generate things that become exhibitions, not necessarily immediately, but over time. And of course, one of the hard things is we've been having to do that all virtually. Uh, so Alex and I are super excited we're going to Portland on Friday to do our first like in-person uh, post-vaccination uh, studio visit because there's something magical that happens when you're engaging directly with art and with artists that just doesn't really happen on Zoom. Um, and I, that's why I really encourage you all to get out and see art and be with art. Um, it's great that we have virtual tours and all these programs and things, but the the you know, the practical, the direct uh, experience of something is, is, is so much more meaningful. Any other questions? I have one that we typically ask to our host. So um, do you have any like tips or suggestions for students, uh, specifically like first and second year students, because that is kind of Pathfinder's main demographic that they feel like, or that you feel like they should know about um, like Northeastern, the resources at, resources at Northeastern, like Gallery 360, um, anything kind of like that? Yeah, I would say um, uh, the arts tend to be really fabulous places for meeting people and engaging with ideas. And yet often um, they're only known by the group of students that are really engaged with them. So like the theater program at Northeastern is amazing. Um, they do some of the most experimental uh, kind of mind altering, like fabulous work, um, working with both kind of more traditional uh, scripts and, um, and stuff that's being, you know, written right now. Um, and so things like getting involved in looking at what's on at the studio theater, right next to Gallery 360, for example, just going, going to one of those productions, um, you know, sign up, go to one of those productions, see what they're doing. Um, some of those things, you know, you think maybe you have to belong. Uh, maybe you have to already know someone or know something and you really don't. Um, and I think that's really the story of some of the great, the greatest kind of art that's happening on campus. Um, and Gallery 360 is similar. You know, you have this, this glass wall so you can see in, but a lot of people think they can't go in. Uh, it's free, it's for you. Um, and so I just encourage you to kind of, to really step into spaces um, and, and to remember that they're, they're all for you. Um, and to not be held back by any presumption that you have of, I don't understand contemporary art or I don't know anyone here. Um, so yeah, so that's something I think I would say about resources. Um, I would, something that I love is the 24 hour chat with librarians. 
uh, that you can have. Um, so if you're doing a paper or you're trying to source a book um, or you're wondering what's in the archives, um, I've just um, been really impressed and, and had wonderful conversations with folks in the library. Um, what else? I think another thing I love about Northeastern is the fact that it's an arboretum. Like there, I don't think there's any other urban campus that has, that is basically on an arboretum. So the idea there is that we have enough biodiversity in our, in our trees and plants uh, to qualify as an arboretum. Um, and so this, I think, you know, you can, you can spend some time finding these really beautiful places on campus in the midst of a busy city. There is green space. There's a, you know, a space for reflection and meditation of the koi pond. You can find beautiful blooming flowers at any one time. Um, that's something that I've already appreciated. Uh, Alex, are there any things you think you might wanna add? Um, besides my obligatory message of join Spark, like I always say, um, one thing that I, I would just say in general is, um, I feel like just making the most of your of your time is really important because you'll get to just try your hand at so many more things than I think you realize and things that are like going to be a lot more difficult to just try your hand at like when you leave. So like, for example, like here, like I've gotten to just like try my hand at, you know, curating an exhibition or like booking concerts or like all of these things that like I wouldn't get to just like no one would just like hand do that outside of, you know, a university environment. So like just really take advantage of that while you're here. Um, and like seek out those types of, of opportunities to just like try something you've just generally been interested in no matter how much you know about it or don't at the time. One last thing um, linked to that is take classes that don't necessarily fit your um, very strongly defined preconditioned career path. I do find that Northeastern students, it's, it's wonderful that folks are very much thinking about applications and real world problems and like how they'll use these things in industry. Um, but I just, I really wanna encourage you to take risks, uh, to take a course that's maybe doesn't fit the path. Um, you'd be amazed at how the connections grow you uh, and the challenge and the thinking outside the box will inform whatever it is you end up doing. Um, so yeah, I, I have found that, that um, students can kind of come in with a very particular idea of what they're doing and why they're doing it and everything has to count in this very particular way. But there are ways in which um, thinking outside the box, uh, taking different classes, taking a risk, following a, a little interest um, can also lead you in interesting directions. I think that's it. Yeah, that's great advice, especially because Northeastern doesn't have like a, it has like required things but it's very flexible compared to other universities so I think that's important to always remember that you you might still have to take a certain like science or literature or whatever but you you can take it in all these different topics and really broaden your passions and experiences so yeah thanks for bringing that up sure um well I think that's all we have today um thank you so much for joining us it was really great working with both of you um and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm so excited to go to campus and I have a class this summer on campus. So I'm gonna visit Gallery 360, certainly. I walk through there all the time though. But in we have class, a great but... new exhibition coming up that we are just working on right now, which is called A Thread Extended. And it is about relationships that artists have to land and landscape um, and the marks that we leave on land and the, the marks it leaves on us. Um, so I encourage you to come and see that from mid-June. I'm good. All right. Thank you Great. so much. Great. Thanks so much. Bye.